In this talk, I will first introduce the concept of pre-lab workshops, a tool that has been increasingly being used for preparing the players for labs. Then we will go out and we will have uh, some exercises on how to use workshop techniques to foster the players' understanding of culture. And on Friday, Christopher will have a, a workshop where we go into methods for creating characters and relations. But first, I want all of you to take a paper and a pen that you are getting at the moment. I have just returned from a strange country far, far away. And I am telling you about what I saw there. I saw a beast, a beast or an animal. It was very large, with a big head, large eyes, large nose, large ears. It's not furry, it's rather has a skin with scales and large teeth. And sometimes it can become very angry. Some of the people I met, they have tamed this beast and used it for warfare. So you can try to draw this for me now. Just take half a minute and draw it. It's a large one. It has a big head, large eyes, large nose, large ears. It's not furry. It has a hard skin and it has large teeth and it can sometimes become very angry. And some people have tamed it and used it for war. I have called this talk Player Workshops. And I see that you want more time for drawing, but you can stop drawing now, it's okay. <laughs> wow, you're really uh, into drawing this. Uh, <laughs> okay. But please finish now so I can continue. I've called it Player Workshops, and that's because sometimes we have workshops with the, which can be with the organizers only of a LARP. But this is what you do when you have a workshop with your players. And earlier we heard Eirik talk about the paralarp, which is what goes on before and after the LARP, uh, and how the LARP is just a part of a process. On this slide I have listed some communication channels that you can use during the paralarp. Some ways to convey to your players what you need to communicate. You can use written text, that's a commonly used method, writing down what is the culture, what is the universe. You can base it on fictional or real world cultures. You can say this is Harry Potter culture or this is ancient Rome, we will do it as the Romans do. You can have talks or lectures where somebody tells the players what they need to do or what they should do. You can say we base it on a movie, you can be inspired by that. You can give special instructions to someone so that during the LARP they are doing something that uh, is important. You also have multi-way communication that can be a physical meeting or a digital meeting where people uh, can have a discussion. And then I have listed what I would say is participatory ways of communication. And with this I mean that several people can communicate, can say something at the same time. It's not just one person speaking. And that can include playing and it can include, include co-creative sessions. When we talk about player workshops, it is usually a gathering for the players that mainly uses these participatory methods. Although you can use other methods in a workshop as well. What can a workshop be used for? The player workshops are sometimes used just simply to give information, which you could do in a normal meeting too. They are used for building player trust, for establishing the ensemble. And the ensemble is the players you have at hand. So it means make them work together, make them feel safe with each other. You can use it uh, to establish the magic circle if you have a workshop early before the LARP people will get the sense that no, this process has started, I am starting to be part of, of the Paralarp. It can be used for game mechanics to exercise them. Yesterday you played New Voices in Art where you had this method for using your pen on the glass. 
that's a quite simple method so it doesn't need so much exercise but sometimes you have more complicated methods that people need to train you can use it to exercise skills maybe people need to be able to dance or fight or ride a horse to go to your LARP in that case you can do that in the workshop but mostly you can use it for game content and for establishing characters and relations calibrating the relations establishing the culture and calibrating the culture and this is what we will work with here at the summer school how can we use it uh, to communicate about social dynamics at the LARP usually when we work with social dynamics in a workshop we get some ensemble building for free because people play together and they work together and then they also become a better ensemble but I would like to first say, what is calibration? Uh, Christopher was also talking about calibration, and I've used it twice here. According to a dictionary, uh, it is to alter or regulate as so to achieve accuracy or conform to a standard. The term calibration is usually used for fine instruments such as clocks or other tools for measuring something. And social dynamics is much more complex. Uh, we can't use instruments to measure social dynamics. So when we do this, when we calibrate our understanding, it's not a complete calibration. We will not have the exact same understanding of the culture or, or on the, of the relation, but we can try to get everyone on the same page. More or less, we have the same understanding. So now I'd like to see your drawings, if you want to just show them. Or you can look around and see a little bit how the different drawings look. Okay, you can take down the drawings. So all of these drawings, they was made from the same description. And uh, can I please, uh, I understand you're very excited about your drawings, but uh, we, I will give you time to talk about them in the break. Uh, <laughs> You saw a lot of different drawings here, and it's all made from the same description. So my purpose of doing this was just to see how different a simple creature can be drawn when you have only a verbal description to go from. I have some other drawings here. They are of elephants. Um, this is made by a medieval artist who had read about elephants but never seen one. And uh, it might or might not fit the description you got. The description he or she read. Here is one too. Uh, this is my favorite elephant. I think actually it's a quite impressive representation from someone who has never seen a real elephant. Um, but social dynamics, it's even more complicated than creatures because it's not a physical thing. So it's even more demanding to explain it. And my point is that the non-participatory methods of just talking or writing a text, they are not very well adapted to establish a culture or establish relations. We need to have mutual understanding. We need to have people understand it both ways. It doesn't matter if I portray a character that is really afraid of you, if you don't really uh, understand that this is part of our dynamic. These uh, uh, social phenomena, uh, I believe, should be communicated through uh, co-creative uh, communication. And that means that you might very well use one-way or multi-way communication to establish uh, the relations and the culture, but I think it's necessary to use participatory methods to calibrate it. If you also use participatory methods to create it, like Christopher said, you don't need to separate the calibration, then you can integrate the calibration in the creation. But okay, why if this is so, if it's so good with, uh, with these uh, participatory methods, with playing out scenes and almost LARPing, why can't we just start the LARP and, and do it there instead of workshopping? I'd like to, uh, to have a little talk about that as well. And laissez-faire, it means uh, let it be, and it's from business. It's about uh, people just saying, let us do it, let us be uh, independent of the authorities. So it means you just let it go and you see what happens. 
I believe that the laissez-faire approach, uh, it means that you are no longer treating new and old players alike. While the workshop, it gives more uh, empowerment to the new players to get on the same uh, page. The workshop can also be used to raise awareness about stereotypes. If you just start playing, it's very easy that you just import stereotypes from your own culture. The workshop can be used to reduce discrepancy. That means that we, uh, we interpret things differently. If you workshop, you can discover that and you can make it seamless before you start playing. It increases the ownership uh, of what is going on. The players feel that they have been part of creating it uh, and they have been creating it together. The start of the game is easier less anxiety of doing it wrong. I suppose most of you have entered a lab thinking I'm not sure if I'm doing this the right way. If you workshop first you can take away that anxiety. You have less confusion, players feeling safe, they are usually more easy to play <coughs> up against. And it promotes more subtle play. Maybe you have learned during the workshop that you can just with a look you can say, I hate you to someone, or I love you, instead of you have to stand up and scream it. So I would say that the only drawback with, with the workshop versus the laissez-faire approach is that, of course, it takes a lot of time. At the summer school, we are going through two sessions that are going specifically into the pre lab workshop territory. Uh, and today we will work with culture, and later with uh, characters and relations. And I think we'll have an um, added on, on of ensemble building with both. So I will present now what we are doing in today's culture workshop that Grete will lead outside afterwards. We will work mostly with cultural calibration. And that means that we have established a culture for you, but you will calibrate the understanding. What is culture? It's uh, a, a textbook definition can be shared mental assumptions that guides interpretations and actions by defining appropriate behavior for various situations. Or simply how things work here. Culture, it can change, but it takes time. And usually culture will only change rapidly if there is an external shock such as if you have a culture where there is always a tradition for sharing food and then you have a hunger catastrophe, maybe that norm breaks down. People stop sharing food overnight. But generally it takes more time. So I'd like to show you some picture and get some suggestions on how you think the culture might be among the people you see here. I have the, these guys first. <coughs> do you get any ideas of what kind of culture there might be here? What, how they do things, what kind of uh, common assumptions they have in this community. Yes? No rules. No rules, okay. Yeah? Drugs are cool. Drugs are cool, okay. Yeah? Sharing. Sharing, yeah. Yes? Rebels. Sorry? Rebels. Yeah. yeah, okay. So we have some, all of these are parts of an identity or part of a culture that you could have interpreted from this picture. These guys then. <laughs> Brotherhood. Yeah. Freedom. Freedom, yeah. Uniformity. Uniformity, yes. Elitism. Elitism. Drugs. Drugs. Masculinity. Masculinity. Motorcycles. Motorcycles, okay, yeah. Loyalty to each other. Brotherhood. Brotherhood, yeah. Boldness. Boldness, okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> How about these people? LARPers. <laughs> LARPers, yeah, but if you think of the characters instead of the people they really are? Yes? Knowledge. Knowledge, yeah. Yes? Sorry? Uh, uh, who's? No? Okay, yeah. Elitism, yes. Weirdos. Weirdos. Creativity, yes. Anachronism. Anachronism. Yeah. Ah. Okay. So we have some different assumptions uh, of these pictures. And here we had one example that was based on just a random picture. You don't really know who these people were. So we just had some ideas generating from that. 
We had one real world phenomenon, the MC people, and we have one phenomenon that's based on a fictional world. But even if you are all Harry Potter experts, you would need to calibrate to play coherently who these people were. So the method we will use today, it's very simple, it's called rehearsal. And rehearsal is something actors always do, uh, but many LARPers think that they don't need to do it. I think it can be very good if we rehearse a little bit more often. So what is the method about? It's simple, it's about playing, observing and evaluating. And today we will play some everyday scenes, some rites, rituals and some taboos, if we have the time. What do we do when we observe? We observe both the obvious and the exotic. And with this I mean that it's important also to observe, okay, when these people meet, they shake hands. That's something we are used to, but since we are working with understanding a culture, we need to also note these things that we take for granted. And then, of course, the exotic. It could be, for example, that instead of, of, of waving to each other when you see each other from a distance, uh, you hit yourself in the head like this. It would be exotic because it's very different from what we are used to. And then finally we evaluate. And how do we evaluate as LARPers? Is it about how cool it looks? No, not really. Uh, we have some suggested criteria for how to evaluate if you want to keep or change what you see. And these are the questions we'd like you to ask. Is it in line with the vision? Is what we are seeing in line with what we want to make? And for this to work, it's important that the organizers have conveyed the vision to the players and also that the players have agreed to the vision. The next question, and most important perhaps, is, is this playable for all? If you create a culture where, for example, all the men, they are always sitting and just cooking food and, and watching the children, and the women are always out uh, being heroes and fighting the monsters, maybe that can be a little boring for the men after a while. So if you want to have that culture, it can be important to find some other things for the men to do as well, so they don't always have to just cook and watch the children. Is it sustainable? That means, is it something we can do for the duration of the LARP? Maybe it's fun to have a culture where you are always standing on one foot if you are playing a LARP for 10 minutes, but it might be tiresome if you are going to do that for two days. Can we increase playability? Can we make this even more interesting? It's also a question we should ask ourselves. And then finally, if it's safe and if it's practical. If you have a culture for throwing glowing coal on each other, maybe it needs to be changed, even though it's probably playable in some way. <laughs> when we have evaluated, maybe we find out we need to change this, and then we can replay and we can repeat the process. So the case we will use today is based on a fantasy lab Greta and I made together some years ago, and we had this vision to explore what is loyalty in a clan society, how is loyalty to a clan affected uh, by the crossing lines of classes, religions and generations. And for this lab we made four clans that were very simple. We made six or seven bullet points for each and let the players find out the rest using uh, this uh, kind of workshop. And here you can see the four clans. We had uh, the, the, the shield is the mountain people, the, the anchor is the ocean people, and the leaf is the plains or village people, and the horse is the fields horse people. And we will work with the ocean people and the horse people today. And this is, uh, as um, Christopher talked about and, and Bjarke talked about, uh, sometimes the organizer define a little bit. We define this by text as our channel. So this is Usiam, uh, and they are living by the sea. They make decisions by consensus. It's a patriarchy. Uh, the men are at sea and the women are at home, but there are sea maidens, and that's boats with only um, female sailors. They have the slogan of less is more. Uh, they have many relations to the outside world because they are sailors and their main value is freedom. Consensus means that everyone agrees. Instead of, for example, voting for against three, we will do this. You discuss until everyone agrees. 
This was their values, this is what you will get, and we will workshop the rest. We will repeat this. The other clan is the Higam, the horse people. They live on the plains. They have no formal power structure. They are close to nature, shared resources. They treat he horses as equally worthy as humans. They believe in reincarnation and their value is spirituality. So here on the fader of culture creation, we are somewhere in the middle, but above, a little bit above towards that it's player created because we as organizers have only created six or seven bullet points and you will create the rest. We have used the channel of verbal communication and text in form of bullet points to convey the first part of the culture and we will use the channel of participatory methods to convey the parts you are creating among yourself. So that's it and now we will go out to the pavilion and we will use this method. You can take a little break on your way if you need some water or snacks uh, but in five minutes we start in the red pavilion outside. <laughs>